The whole of your body, except for your private parts, can be scarred. You are clothed most of the time, but not in front of your wife, and not when you swim, either. Don't forget, it's the emotion of being scarred. Hey everyone, I'm Granol, and welcome to Let's Play The Cursed Sword of Shagganother. So, I'm guessing this is going to be the first of many, many twine games in this. So let's get started. Your people have gone three years without paying tithes to warlord Mumtaz, sorcerer king of the Ashen Waste. The bushels you should have sent him instead go to hungry mouths of babes. Well, you know, that, that's a good place for them to go. Not, you know, as bushels, but... They need to eat. The babes sicken and die, and the bushels rot in the granary. Old men say that the Sorcerer King has cursed the village's harvest. Okay, maybe we should be giving him the, the tithes then, since this is not an ideal situation. When the northern sky turns dark with the smoke of hostile campfires, the men of your village gather their bronze swords and leather shields. Your newlywed wife weeps over the hearth as if you are already dead. Well, you know, I don't want to be a wuss, so I'm going to go and dutifully march to war with the others. You kiss your wife on the forehead and heft your shield over your shoulder. Though she weeps on your threshold, her tears are proud. You march with vigor and enthusiasm, even the hardest, hardiest, that word is hardiest, veterans are impressed by the force of your will. Soon the rising fire smoke of the Sorcerer King's numberless hordes blocks out the sun. The battlefield is not far ahead. Well, I guess it's time to camp. The ashes drifting from the campfires of the Sorcerer King's numberless hordes have already stained the battlefield's turf with a shade of corpse flesh gray. You know, we need a new descriptor for his hordes. We've already had numberless. Could definitely use with a new adjective there. You and your fellow soldiers stand uneasy at the edge of the tree line, in numb realization of your folly. Your force is less than a hundred strong. The horde across the plain is too vast to even count. See? that That's a, another description. There we go. But the fear of disgrace is too great. That night, the men of your village sit around the fire, readying their gear with automatic motions. When you close your eyes, you can see your wife stretched, bleeding in the ruins of your burning town. When you wake in the morning, you have hardly rested, but the Sorcerer King's armies stand already in their battle lines. The oldest soldiers among you face the enemy with impassive expressions. They have found deep reserves of bravery and honor in the face of certain death. Well... You know, I, I think I'm going to go out like the veterans. Because, again, I don't want to be a wuss. As the others stand rigid and silent, you raise your father's sword and beat it upon your shield. Thump! Thump! You praise your gods of death and blood with a guttural cry, and soon the others join with you. As the sun burns the fog from the plain, you raise a defiant shout. And then the chant ends and the moment comes. You lead the others in a charge across the battlefield. Wait, 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 wait. I'm leading the charge? I, I didn't want it. That, that is more than I signed up for. That is terrible. War is a cyclone of blood and bronze. Now and then you catch moments of clarity. An enemy face contorted by rage splits beneath your sword. It falls to the ground and you realize it was painted war mask. Behind it, a man's dazed face shines with wet blood. Dazed, you suffer blow after blow on the flat of your shield. Your arm aches. You stagger. You lose sight of your friends in the crowd. For a moment, the glare of sun off burnished armor blinds you. You shield your eyes with an arm and see the Sorcerer King standing before you in all his spiked and skull-studded glory. Above his head, he hoists a jagged blade carved with ancient runes, the cursed sword of Shagganother. 
well, you know what? I'm screwed, but I think I can take him. Before you can do anything, the Sorcerer King knocks you on your back with a mailed fist. The cursed sword of Shaganother slices down toward your chest. The very air seems to scream in pain as the sword splits it. Well, I, I guess I couldn't take him. Whoops. At first you do not feel the cuts that the Sorcerer King inflicts upon your body. He does not wound to kill. He kicks you over the spiked boot and jabs once, then again and again. The smell of burning flesh fills your nostrils. Your eyes fill with tears and blood. Above the wails of the dying, you hear the Sorcerer King walking towards you, his boots clanking. But he does not kill you. Instead, he knees. Knees? I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna guess that was intended to be kneels. Instead, he kneels on the bloody earth and whispers in your ear, "I have marked you." He whispers with the voice like the hissing of a hundred snakes, "You are mine." Well, I'm gonna guess this is a bad situation, but I think I can take him. With a roar, you rise up on your elbow and force the hilt of your sword into the Sorcerer King's neck. He gasps and staggers back. So he's dead now, right? I mean, if I jammed the hilt of my sword into his neck, that means I win. Right? Right? Unless I, like, did it dumbly and hit him with the side of the... that That's probably what I did. You rise slowly to your feet dripping blood and sweat. You bare your teeth and show the Sorcerer King that you will not be beaten like a dog. The Sorcerer King raises the cursed sword of Shaganother once more, but you see a change in his glittering eyes. He takes a step back. It matters not, he says, and then he turns and vanishes into the chaos of battle. You sway and collapse to your knees. Your vision darkens. See? I, I knew I could take him. Just, you know, without the whole actually winning part. Yeah. So, time to wake up! You stagger to your feet. By the light of the moon, you can see corpses and shattered armor scattered around you. Here and there, a face you recognize stares back, slack jawed and gray. You drag yourself to the tree line. Under the branches, a handful of men from your village have gathered to bind their wounds. These are all the survivors. You do not look one another in the eyes. Uh, you know what? There's, there's always hope. And we can take him, right? You urge the others to hurry onward. We must protect the village! You remind them. The Sorcerer King may already be there! But the others' eyes are glazed and unfocused. They are pale and weak. You urge two of the strongest to stand and follow you. For a while you walk together through the woods, but soon you realize that you cannot hear their steps. When you turn around, they are gone. What gives you strength when the others fall? You alone fell beneath the cursed sword. You felt its slashes. But can you feel them now? You put a hand on your chest. No blood seeps from your wounds. In a clearing, you inspect your cuts by the light of the moon. But they are closed and sealed already. Oh, well, time to actually get home. There are no ruins and no smoke. The village sits unharmed in the valley below you. You hurry down the slope. By the time you reach the gates of the village, a crowd has gathered. Wives, fathers, mothers, and children see that you are alone and begin to wail. But your father-in-law steps forward and grips you by the arm. He has lost two sons today, but you have survived. You have returned to us, he says, with half a snarl, unharmed. You look down. The cuts from the cursed sword are closed and dry, like thin lips pursed tightly. Um, you know what? I've been doing the whole bringing hope thing for a bit, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start lying. We were outnumbered, you say, but our brave men drove them back. 
They were shocked to see the fury of our retaliation. The villagers around you murmur and nod. Their tears begin to dry. Your husbands and sons fought valiantly, you shout. We turned the sorcerer king back, but at great cost. Your father-in-law gives you a strange look. He seems to see through you. You're covered in blood, he says, but your wounds are closed. What has happened? You have no answer for him. Never mind, he says, and forces a smile. You must see your wife. We must celebrate your return. And hey, I get a feast. Awesome. Your wife throws herself into your arms, and the whole village gathers to celebrate your return. Men who disrespected you before now bring you horns full of mead. The children of your enemies are eager to polish your sword. Your wife heaps your trencher with meat. This, this almost makes me feel bad for lying to them, you know? Almost. You respond with toasts to the dead, but you feel empty and drained, like a corpse left to hang. Split faces, and when no one watches, your hands are drawn to the scars on your body. What curse did the sword bring? I feel as though we're missing some words there. I, I, I think the split faces and continues on into the rest of a sentence, and then that sentence ends, it, and we get the when no one watches. Probably like split faces and shattered armor fill your mind, memory, whatever. Your father-in-law watches you from across the hall. He does not smile or cheer. When you toast, he remains seated. Man, this guy does not like me. Alright, time to go back to the hut with the wife. You collapse on a pile of blankets. Your wife throws herself across you, showering you with kisses. How am I so lucky? She cries, that my husband alone should be the one to return from battle. I don't know, you say. Your voice sounds distant in your ears. Are these your scars? She asks, tracing a line across your chest. Have they healed so quickly? You watch as she explores the scars on your chest and arms. Her lips are pressed together and her brows are lowered. They've healed so fast, she says again. Then she picks one, a long, jagged mark reaching from your collarbone to your navel. How did you earn this one, my husband? Don't pick it! It won't heal properly if you pick it! Uh, I'm going to lie to her about how I got that one. A mighty swordsman slashed at me, you say. But I leapt backwards, and only the tip of his sword caught me. Your wife puts on a frightened look, then smiles. It only barely cut you, she says. You must have been so quick. Then she finds another scar, a shallow groove running across your belly. Her fingers tickle. What about this one, she asks. How did you get this one? Uh, I'm going to continue to lie to her. <laughs> one of their war dogs lunged at me, you say. The tip of his fang scraped me there. Your wife giggles. You moved like lightning on the battlefield, she says. Then she rolls you on your stomach, kneading the aching muscles in your shoulders. Then she stops and traces another line from your neck to the middle of your back. And what about this one, she asks. How did this happen? You know what? I want to know what happens if I tell her the horrible truth. The Sorcerer King of the Ashen Waste, you say in a weak and strangled voice. That was not exactly a weak and strangled voice, was it? He cut me there with the cursed sword of Shaganother. Your wife pulls back. Her face is pale. She rubs her hands together as if to rub the touch of you off them. What does that mean? She asks. Are you cursed? No. Your wife smiles nervously. He cannot curse you anyway she says, since you beat him. I did, you agree. You kiss her and roll together across the firs. And later? Long after midnight, you startle awake. 
The blankets are drenched in sweat. Your wife is huddled on the other side of the room, her back towards you. You stand. Your skin seems to itch all over. Well, this could be bad. A cold wind rolls through the streets of the village, and you shiver. The moonlight touches you. You look down. Across your chest and arms, the scars are opening. They yawn. They bare teeth. Long, greasy tongues loll out. Acid drool drips from your ravenous scars. They hiss like snakes. They hurt again, like new wounds. You double up and scream. These scars are driving you mad with pain. So I'm guessing I'm cursed. The greasy tongues lash your skin. The teeth chomp and drool. You stagger into the street trying to hold the scars closed, but they gnaw on your fingers. When they bite, the pain dulls. The greasy tongues stretch. They rip the railings from the fence beside the road and champ them into splinters. It helps. You stagger towards your neighbor's hut. I... I'm going to resist, because I don't want to destroy my village. You try to turn away, but your scars have other plans. The greasy tongues stretch and curl around neighbor's doorframe. The teeth chomp through wood. The tongues stretch and pull. The door cracks open. Though your arms and legs hang limp and weak, the tongues reach out on their own and seize flesh. Someone gives a strangled scream and hurls a torch, but a tongue reaches out to snatch it. Others reach out to crack the roof beams. Cold air rushes in and flames roar up. You find yourself in the road covered in slime and sweat. Your skin is smeared with blood, but the pain is returning, and across the road there is another hut. I'm going to continue to resist. This is... I, I don't want to... Yeah, I, I don't want to be a monster. I don't want to destroy my village. I'm going to fight this, even though I apparently can't. You claw at the ground, but the tongues unfurl from your scars and walk you across the road like spider's legs. The door shatters. Walls collapse. Someone reaches for the knife beneath their pillow, but your scars are too quick for them. You stagger into the road again. Now people are waking up, screaming, running from house to house. Someone sees you and stumbles backward in horror. No! you shout, but they turn and run anyway. The scars hiss at them, and their tongues reach out blindly into the darkness. Across the road, you see your father-in-law's hovel. You know, I know he doesn't like me. So, I think at this point my best chance is to resist so that he kills me, and I don't destroy the rest of the village. Eh? Huh? Eh? Huh? In the end, you close your eyes. Your scars do as they will. You hear screams and feel flames against your face, but it is far beyond you to stop the scars left by the cursed sword of Shaganother. The tongues are stilled. They hold you upright in the middle of the road. You crack an eye open and look down. There is hardly anything left of yourself to recognize. Once, you wondered, why didn't Warlord Mumtaz, the Sorcerer King, send his army to punish your village? Why didn't he knock the hovels down and burn them? Well, the, the, uh, I think that's because he was cursing the bushels of stuff that we weren't giving to him. That seems like a fairly obvious answer. You lurch through the burning wreckage of your village, averting your eyes from the faces of the dead. Slowly, the scars close. The tongues reel themselves back in. You fall to your knees, a normal man once more. But across the road, by the tree line, you see two familiar figures, your wife and her father. They are hurrying toward the undergrowth. Your wife turns to look over her shoulder. I don't like the wording here. It's either chase them down or I do not need to chase them down. I don't want to chase them down. If I go toward them, I'm going to end up killing them. And I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to go with don't need to. There is no need to hunt them down. The father, you already bit him. Even at this distance, you can see his own scar shining red on his shoulder. 
In the morning, when they finally stop running, will he have already changed? The end. Ah. I, I hope I cut out all the coughs, because there were a lot of them. That voice just destroyed my throat. <laughs> so, yeah, this has been Let's Play the Cursed Sword of Shaganother. I'm Granhull. See you guys next time.